So let's just get this out of the way first. This video will contain spoilers for New Replicant and if you're already planning on playing the game yourself, I highly recommend you do that before watching this. New Replicant sets itself apart by building a gut-wrenching narrative that is emotionally uncomfortable with lots of suffering and anguish being present for protagonists and even the most secondary characters. It's definitely the most captivating aspect of the game as it delivers a message of hope and kindness but also about a world full of unfairness and pain. What makes the narrative work so well in Nier is how it can make players feel a level of discomfort so close to what the protagonists feel in the story, and the game does this by telling a very detailed and thorough prologue, but without making it boring in any way. The game builds a strong foundation of the world it takes place by covering all bases. The environments, the people, your protagonists, how the people live, what rules they are subject to, etc. And as the foundation is finished, it suddenly shatters each and every one of these elements without mercy, going completely against any other RPG game out there. Since prologues are usually so boring, games and fantasy stories tend to skip them as fast as they can. People want to get in on the action as quickly as possible, but the cost of this is that the audience doesn't really relate to what normal is like in the world that the story takes place. For example, in Kingdom Hearts 1, we don't really relate to Sora being stuck in an island for 14 years before he can see other worlds, because the section you're stuck there is so small, it feels like the norm for him is to go around traveling on a spaceship and defeating monsters. We can't understand why people say Riku, his best friend, has changed because, well, everything we saw from this character has been the same ever since this game started like two hours ago. The same applies for your usual adventure book. We start off with the protagonist facing a world that has rules they don't agree with or that don't fit them. It works for Maze Runner and Hunger Games for instance. The stories start off very closely to the protagonist's conflicts coming up, so you don't actually relate to how the people living there feel. And this is where Neo Replicant really sets itself apart. As you play the game, it doesn't even feel like you're inside this massive prologue. It feels like your cliche story. Boy meets a super powerful entity that will give him new abilities, and that's the start of all the conflicts coming their way. They face all kinds of problems together as they grow closer and gather allies to help them on their cause. The world gets so comforting and welcoming. You know exactly where everything is. Oh, I need to find some sheep? I know a great spot on the northern plains. Oh, looks like I need to get in touch with the blacksmith. He should be in the main village at the end of the road. I need to visit the village of the Airy? No problem, this is the best way to go there and I already have some other stuff to do there anyways. As the world sets itself up, you feel like you've mastered it, you understand it, you live there. This is your protagonist's daily life. This is how this medieval-like world works. This is the kind of problems they have. These are the locations. These are its people. But as this long prologue comes to a close, the game suddenly destroys each and every single one of these pieces. People are killed. Locations decimated. The environments change and so does the wildlife. Everything you took for granted changes in very fast-paced steps. And that's how players relate to it so much more. They actually feel the discomfort of massive change, of something actually being destroyed that was a huge part of their lives. These aren't just some random locations of a fantasy world anymore. They're places you knew like the palm of your hand. These are people you know because they've been on this journey with you since the start of the game. And the huge aspect of this is owned not only to the main story, but the side quests too. They play a massive role in this. Much similar to the main story, you get comfortable with all the elements that are part of Neo Replicant's world as you go around solving more problems and issues that are part of their daily lives. It's in these side quests that players will really get used to walking around and getting stuff done. There's a ton of missions, and they're rewarding with equipment and cash that comes very much in handy. So you'll really be going all over the map, visiting places over and over and over again. I will say though that these missions are super grindy. 
I'm not gonna lie, they're pretty standard gameplay of collecting materials and defeating monsters, and I would even call them mediocre in format. It gets a little boring for a video game, but that's the whole point. It's supposed to sink you into this world and get used to it, even if it seems trivial. So Replicant uses the audience knowledge of this genre and its cliches to backfire on them. And even if you can feel that there's something wrong and there's a twist coming, the truth will always be a step further, which leads to those surprises and discomfort. Like, it's clear that Shades aren't just some regular monsters devoid of emotion. There's lots of evidence throughout the game that show this, but there's no way you would realize that they're the actual humans in this world before the reveal. So side quests build this world of standard, run-off-the-mill gameplay to build the game's subversion of storytelling. This makes the game's foundation that much stronger, which pulls in players for its simplicity and rewards. And even if you don't complete all of them, that doesn't really matter, as you usually be stopping whenever you get accustomed to the world of Nier, which is the ultimate goal. Even if it means getting bored. And when this massive prologue that takes 50% of the game's story finally ends, we see a huge shift in narrative. Now that the world is built, Yokotaro will go ahead and destroy everything in it, and the usual cheerful settings and happy endings make space for much more a bit of sweetness, if not flat out depressing resolutions, as everything seems to take a turn for the worse. And once again, this is not exclusive to the main story, as even the side quests become darker and have more ambiguous endings, where you don't really know if you did the right thing or not. And now that we have played through so much, that we've seen so much of their lives, that we've traveled to all the corners of this world, now we really feel these blows. I knew those kids by the fountain, they were always playing there, I can't believe they died. There are so many monsters everywhere now, there's no way people are getting by. The area was full of dicks, but how can that whole city be just gone now? And that's what makes Nier so outstanding, but heartbreaking. You've been invested in all these characters before you even realize it. And even if so much goes wrong, I do believe the message this game has is that there's a lot of kindness in the world, and we can spread that kindness to help others if we actively choose to do so. That doesn't mean it's easy and black and white, like most stories will have you believe. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's easy to fall into selfishness, and oftentimes it's hard to know what the best thing to do is. But we all need each other, and it's important being there for the ones you love the most, and actively choosing to be there for them. And this was it for my analysis. Man, <laughs> this one was a bit more serious, huh? I guess it's inevitable when you talk about Nier. Well, you folks know the drill, if you liked it, consider leaving a comment, a like, or subscribing, and so on. I appreciate your support very much, so really, thank you all. Falou e até mais!